Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm missing my glorious podium. I don't know where it is, but, you know, this microphone's making me look thin anyway. So, welcome to tonight's program. I'm Bella Gerlich. I'm Dean of Libraries, for those of you that haven't been here before. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A panel discussion on Python Behind Python, Critical Engagements with Culture. We're proud to be hosting tonight's panelists, all of whom are Texas Tech faculty, two of whom are in the library. Lynn Whitfield is an archivist for the Southwest Collection, Special Collections Library. Dr. Paul Rin Rinch, I just asked him how to pronounce it and I forgot already, is a professor of practice in the School of Theater and Dance. And of course, Rob Weiner is the University Library's pop culture guru and the librarian for the JT and Margaret Talkington College of Visual and Performing Arts. Before we begin the program, I want to present each of them with a token of our appreciation for their partnership. Will you help me please, sir, from behind the curtain? Oh, that's awesome. They also get a framed poster <laughs> for tonight's thing. Uh, we're recording tonight's discussion, and, and in a few days' time, it'll be on ThinkTech, our online publishing and archival service. Watch for the link to this and the other library events on our Twitter pages. And speaking of Twitter, those of you that Twitter, go ahead and get on now with the hashtag Python panel. Feel free to enjoy refreshments and get a free copy of the poster, which I'm sure our panelists will sign for you after the program. Now it is my pleasure to call to the podium Dr. Rinch, who will provide. I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> and we're, we both have German last names, and I can't pronounce it. Who will provide a short presentation about tonight's topic before we begin the Q&A. Ready? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, howdy folks, thanks for coming out. We really appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. Um, I want to briefly tell you what we plan to do for a few minutes here. Um, uh, in brief, we want to talk for a few minutes and then open up for questions. Uh, and then I think at least two of us, perhaps all three of us, wanted to make it over to Lubbock Lights at 7 o'clock, so we don't want to run long. I um, hope you're going to be at Lubbock Lights as well. Um, so what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the book and its contents. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rob and Lynn both for a few minutes, uh, in a few minutes, uh, because they got the book up and running before they invited me to come in. Um, so, uh, and then uh, I have an essay in the book, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my essay very briefly. Uh, Rob has an essay in the collection as well, so we're going to let him talk about his chapter for a couple minutes. Uh, and then we should have plenty of time for any questions uh, that you might have about the book. Uh, happy to entertain your questions. Um, so, uh, Python Beyond Python features new original essays exploring the work of Monty Python members before, after, and even during their work for the group. So, who were these guys? What is Monty Python? Well, Monty Python is a group of six guys, five from the UK, one from the US, best known, as I'm sure you know, for the TV series Monty Python's Flying Circus, and the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Even if you've never, never purposefully watched the Monty Python program, you've almost certainly heard someone quote them or make reference to their work. Now, the image behind us right now is an image that we considered using for the book's cover. We like this image a lot because it does two important things. One, it shows them as a group, as a collective, as a unified whole. But as you can see, it also shows them as six distinct individuals, dressed in six very different ways, representing six very different characters, even wearing six different sorts of shoes. So we like this picture because while they're all white males and they're all working together, it also indicates that they are unified in their own sense of uh, individuality, and that they pooled their strengths and hid their weaknesses to create something that wouldn't exist had they not joined together. So Monty Python's work, especially the TV series and the films, has actually been written about a lot. And this library, in part because of the efforts of Rob Weiner, owns a lot of those books, which might beg the question, why another book about Monty Python? Does the world need another book about Monty Python? Our answer to that would be no, but yes, because our book isn't just about Monty Python. Our book is about the rich and varied careers of these six men, uh, as we said earlier, both before and during and then after their work as a group. So the title, Python Beyond Python, we hope suggests our desire to participate in the conversation around the meanings of Monty Python, but also to expand this conversation, and importantly, to create new conversations about their individual work. In some cases, their work as individuals or in smaller pairs and groups embraces the le legacies of Monty Python. 
But in other cases, their actions seem like deliberate attempts to escape the shadow of Monty Python itself, a desire to have their work labeled something other than, quote, Python-esque. So the essays in our collection are divided into two sections. The first section addresses work from individual members. Uh, the first essay is from a uh, Texas Tech graduate student in theater about Eric Idle's Spamalot as a theater adaptation of the Holy Grail film. The second chapter explores Terry Jones's work as a historian, not a comedian interested in history, but as a practicing and writing historian. The next two chapters each discuss Michael Palin's published diaries and travel programs. Closing out this first section are essays on Terry Gilliam's first film, Jabberwocky, and then also an essay about John Cleese's work in the realm of business training. Uh, that's the essay that I co-wrote, and I can speak about that essay in a few minutes. As we've already seen and you know, um, these are six individual uh, uh, components that form this group with six distinct personalities. From left to right on the screen behind me are John Cleese, Terry Gilliam, Terry Jones, Graham Chapman, Michael Palin, and Eric Idle. Now within this group of six, there were always smaller groups. Cleese and Chapman, the two tallest guys behind me, were both at Cambridge and they frequently wrote together. Eric Idle was also at Cambridge, but a few years behind those two and he tended to write alone. Jones and Palin were at Oxford and they frequently wrote together. And Terry Gilliam, in part because he was an American, but also because he was an illustrator, tended to also work alone. These clusters are also evident in our collection. The second half of the collection addresses work completed and, and thought through, uh, uh, composed by individual pairs, or in some cases five, or in, some, in, in other cases even si all six of these individuals. So in this section section of the book uh, is an essay about the film adaptation of Graham Chapman's uh, book, A Liar's Autobiography. Uh, the next essay offers a survey of their, the work, uh, their work together in part uh, under people like David Frost before they formed Monty Python. Then there's two essays about collaborations between Jones and P Palin for English television. Next is a study of the graphic novel Superman True Brit, which is the work of Cleese and Kim Howard Johnson, an honorary python, and a man who was gracious enough to provide a blurb for our book. Uh, we'll hear about that essay in a few minutes. Uh, and finally, there's a study of the uh, video game Starship Titanic, which features John Cleese and is based on a book from Jones and Douglas Adams, yet another somewhat honorary member of Monty Python. So that's a quick survey of the book's contents. The other way to say this is our book, we're happy to report, and we're very proud of the book, uh, addresses all six members and addresses topics as diverse as video games to diaries to comic books to business training films, all of that in under 250 pages. In retrospect, it almost seems a bit surprising that this book did not already exist. So um, how did this book come to be created? Uh, having said that, I want to turn it over to Rob and Lynn and let them each speak in turn about how this idea got, uh, came to fruition, how it was uh, originated and then came to fruition. So, Well, I had had this idea for a Python book for many years. I would venture to say it was about 10 years in the making. And Lynn and I, along with uh, librarian uh, Jack Becker, produced a book on James Bond in 2010. And Lynn and I had discussed um, possibly doing a Python project in the future. And uh, it finally happened and, and we invited Paul and I'd like to give a shout out to Dr. Reinch because really this book would not have been finished without him. He, he took it under, under the wing under his wing and uh, really did a fantastic job keeping us on task, fantastic. keeping the uh, authors on task and uh, as well. So uh, while it was truly a collaborative project, um, it would not exist without um, Dr. Reinches. Um. And I would like to say, um, if you do streaming television right now, British comedies are very popular. There's yes. BritBox, there's Acorn, there's probably others that I don't know, but the comedies still do really well, particularly the ones from the 80s and late 70s, and I'm a huge uh, British comedy fan, although Monty Python wasn't my intro into this group. It was actually Faulty Towers, and so for me, I I'm probably the least uh, uh, fluent in Monty, uh, in Monty Python, but I have seen their work through other venues because if you watch British television, you know the same actors appear on different shows, whether it's the mysteries or the comedies. And so that was my interest in this area is that I'm a bit of an Anglophile. Well, and apparently um, 
One of my students was telling me that uh, Python has just now hit Netflix. It's so all good. Yeah, which is which is great. And and you know the show is still popular. I mean, there are certain things that are part of our collective unconsciousness. Even the Spam Museum, the mm -hmm. official museum, has the Python skit, the dead mm -hmm. parrot. All those things um, are part of who we are. But getting back to you know the book and how we started out. Um, like I said, we invited Paul and we sent out a call for papers and uh, we got some pretty good abstracts and some not so good abstracts and got some really excellent papers and some really awful ones which did not make the book. Mm -hmm. so. so I think we jump into the next one. So um, if you, the surprising part about producing a book, if you've never done that, is how long it takes from the beginning of the project until the end of the project. It took us two and a half years to get this book published. And um, so we, st we started out by sending out a call for an abstract, and we got those back, reviewed them, and you know, w went through selecting the ones that fit our parameter, um, even with the uh, scope of the project outlined, people still wanted to write about Monty Python, and we had to go back and say, you know, this is an interesting topic, but could you go in this angle, or at least take this approach so that it is a new angle to uh, the Monty Python um, uh, story? And um, some of the uh, topics that we wanted abstracts for but did not receive, as we were hoping to get a chapter on illustrated books for children by Jones and Palin, um, something on Frank Zappa and Terry Gillum, and in particular, we were hoping somebody would write a chapter on uh, uh, Graham Chapman's tour around the U.S. because uh, he supposedly came to Lubbock in the spring of 1988. No supposed about it. I was there. Okay. Well, we can't, I can't find the documentation <laughs> yeah, in the archives. I mean, I, I can't believe that nobody in Lubbock didn't write an article or take a photograph, but I have yet to be able to find that documentation, and we've been looking for it for a few years now. Yeah, we have. Um, there are a few posts about him coming to Texas Tech, uh, and um, you know, from other people who were supposedly there as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, there are no photographs, and nothing yeah. in the Toria door, mm -hmm. um, nothing the in the AJ. But uh, I, I, I remember vividly because my friend had his Apology of Socrates in Greek signed by Chapman, where he signed it ni. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and that said, we went through and picked out the ch abstracts that we wanted to do, and then um, we wrote back to the authors and said, okay, you know, we, these fit with the parameters of our book, and could you give us a full chapter and do it according to this style guide within a couple of months? Um, if you've ever edited a book or journal with authors around the world, you know that. Um, a lot of the work when you do the editing is trying to get everyone's grammar and punctuation and citations all similar. British grammar and American grammar are not the same thing. And like in the case of the Bond book, we had people in Japan and Europe and Canada and just trying to get everyone on board with the same, uh, you know, getting the chapters to look similar and feel like they had been edited. We had the same situation with the, uh, with the Python book. So we did a lot of cleanup and in the process, we probably edited every chapter at least four times. Um, yeah, and there was one chapter, he wanted to talk about Doctor Who. Which is a great topic, yeah. but it's not Monty Python. Yeah, it's not Monty or Python. before or after. Yeah. yeah, but he kept wanting to make these connections, which of course we were pretty brutal with. It was like, no, no, no. Yeah. So not the right topic. Um, so we spent months uh, working on a proposal while the authors were writing their chapters, and um, the, we had a Rob actually had a, a, a publisher who had approached him before we did any of this, saying, "I'm interested in this topic. Could you give me a proposal?" So we worked on their per, their ten page proposal, and it asked the questions uh, such as, um, "What is the originality of the book?" the target audience, how does the book fit into the publisher's product line, identifying where, uh, what the competing publications that are already out on the market, and how was the book going to be marketed? So we, we had to brainstorm on all of this, and at times it felt like we were writing 
all of this that the publishers should have been doing at least part of this, some of their work. Um, but we finally got the draft uh, finished. We, had the, we got the chapters back from the authors and we were able to put together a table of contents along with uh, all the bios of the authors. And so we sent all of this to the publisher. We were so excited. And then they passed on the book. After all this work, and I believe they approached you to begin with. Yeah, and did. so uh, we were like, well, you know, we did all this work. We're not going to give up. And so um, Paul actually took the lead with this and searched for some other publishers who might be interested in this topic. And we lucked out because the publisher that we ended up with, this actually fit their scope. So Palgrave Macmillan is not only a peer-reviewed press, it has a studies and comedy line. This was right up their venue. Uh, the publisher also provided some metrics on the book's activity once it was published. I looked at their page today, and as of today, there have been 3,002 downloads of the book chapters. And I believe that this is a sign that the book's contents are well-written and that the uh, careers and contributions of Monty Python uh, members appeal to a broader international audience. And um, it didn't hurt that, unbeknownst to me, I had actually worked with one of the editors before on this. Who, yeah, who edited it was a blind series. review. Yeah, and um, uh, got a comment from uh, one of the editors at Palgrave saying, you know, that they reread the book and think the whole thing is a solid piece of work. So, and we're we're very proud of it. Yeah. Uh, did you want to add about Kim Howard Johnson? Oh, yes. And uh, approach Kim Howard Johnson, who co-wrote the Superman book with John Cleese, which I'll be talking about in a moment, um, who, who had written a number of biographies of Python, was there when they were filming uh, on The Life of Brian and wrote a diary, which is a really good book in and of itself. And uh, it took me a long time, but we got him to agree to give us a really nice blurb. and. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I'd be happy to read it to you if you'd like. Python fans who want more than 45 TV shows, five films, and stacks of DVDs, CDs, books, and downloads are in for a treat. Python, Beyond Python, delves into areas that are often overlooked by Python fans, showing the vast reach of the legendary group. If you enjoy uninformative, dull, and non-entertaining books about Monty Python. Avoid this one at all cost. <laughs> Dr. Reinsch. Um, so since two of our contributors are here, uh, I'm here and, and Rob's here, I want to give you a brief summary of two of the essays uh, that are in the volume. So I co-wrote an essay about uh, John Cleese's work with a company called Video Arts. Uh, Video Arts was formed by uh, John Cleese and a guy named Anthony Jay and a few other English uh, media professionals in the early 1970s. Uh, Cleese did this right around the same time he was growing tired of Flying Circus. Uh, he's a wrote for season four, but he's not in season four. While the other guys were off making season four of Flying Circus, he was making business training videos with this company, Video Arts. And I'd heard stories from folks um, about these videos. I'd never seen one. Uh, my father is uh, not accidentally, perhaps, a business uh, communications professor. So I grabbed my father and I said, you know something about business, I know something about Monty Python, let's pool our strengths and write about these videos, because I couldn't find anything that had ever been written about them. And the more work I did, the more fascinating they became to me. Uh, this is from the uh, Video Arts webpage in 2014. Um, Cleese no longer is an owner of the company, but as recently as 2014, they were still using his image and quotes from him to promote the company. He's their most recognizable figure. As you see here, along with the picture of Cleese, you have a quote that serves as sort of a summary of their, um, uh, their goals as a business training company, right? The goal to provide sound business training, but also to entertain audiences. And this is obviously where Cleese comes in. And Video Arts, in a lot of ways, trained business training because they did two important things. One, they made videos that were targeted to a wide range of individuals and companies no longer being contracted to an individual company and making a, a product, say, just for AT&T or General Motors, they made videos that would be useful for a range of companies. Second important thing they did is they made films that aren't deadly dull. Many of these films feature John Cleese. So, uh, did an analysis of three films 
um, all called Meetings, Bloody Meetings. This was their best-selling film. Some of you have quite likely seen this. Every time I talk about this film, uh, I see knowing uh, smiles. Uh, this film was so successful, they remade it twice. They even made a sequel, and there's a remake of the sequel. So this thing sold really well because we have all been in really badly run meetings. Mm -hmm. Here again is a topic that's not tied to an individual company. It's tied to anybody that's part of any sort of organization. So they make this video with John Cleese at the center about the pains of being in badly run meetings. Even more importantly, the video teaches how to run meetings well. The film uh, transitions uh, most obviously between four different spaces and communicates uh, four basic ideas in these individual spaces. Uh, moving from top uh, left-hand corner and then in clockwise motion. The film begins with Cleese in bed with his wife, worried about the next day and all the meetings he has to attend. He then falls asleep and has a nightmare about being in uh, a courtroom on trial for how badly he runs meetings. Then inside this dream sequence, we see images of how he actually runs meetings. Uh, and that's the, the corner right behind me. And then furthermore, inside of these flashbacks to how he runs meetings, we get images of the implications of how he runs meetings. So we constantly get images of how, if he ran meetings the way that he did inside a court of law, the very fabric of society would come apart. So the film humorously demonstrates how to badly run a meeting. And Video Arch's goal there in showing incorrect ways to run meetings is to then turn around and say this is the correct way to run meetings. And their argument, in fact, was by showing people the wrong way to do things and doing that humorously, people will retain the lessons better. Now, I'm at work trying to sort out if there's any truth in that, but at least that was their claim. At the very least, they made a lot of money doing this. Cleese made more money from Video Arch than he made from Monty Python. And even though he sold the company in the late 90s, continued to make films with the company. And the other part that the study of uh, Meetings, Bloody Meetings revealed is in the three versions, we see uh, growth in Cleese's confidence and a movement from him being uh, a figure of fun and a figure who needs training to, in fact, the authority. The second of the three versions of Meetings, Bloody Meetings begins with an on-camera to the camera introduction by Anthony Jay. Uh, Anthony Jay is a figure that some of you quite likely are familiar with. Uh, he worked on. Uh, um, uh, Yes, Prime Minister. Yes, Minister, and then Yes, Prime Minister. Yes. Yeah. That's, An that's Anthony Jay, right? Um, Jay is also the uh, intellectual uh, uh, foundation for most of Video Art's work. He actually has uh, publications in, in, the, in various fields inside business. So the second version of Meetings, Bloody Meetings begins with him on camera describing his own expertise, and he wrote the briefcase booklets that came with these films. The third version of the film, though, by the time we get to 2012, begins with an on-camera introduction from John Cleese. And as you can see here, he doesn't just introduce the film as now a, a business expert. So he's become a business expert by making business training videos, which is interesting. But furthermore, inside the film itself, he's no longer the central character that needs to be trained how to run meetings. He is now the judge passing sentence on somebody else who doesn't know how to run meetings. So uh, we used, uh, my co-author and I used Meetings, Bloody Meetings as a case study to try to sort out the history of video arts and to sort out the ways in which it was combining business training principles uh, that had been established already with a desire to entertain or at least to avoid putting audience members to sleep. Um, on that note, let me thank everyone in this building that has anything to do with interlibrary loan because my <laughs> essay would not have been possible without interlibrary loan. Video arts products are priced to be purchased by companies with lots of money. The only way I was able to get access to them is from libraries that had bought them largely for business schools. Uh, these videos were priced at thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, so uh, the way I was able to get access to them was through this library and people that work here very hard. So thank you. I, I thank them inside the essay, but while we're here publicly, thanks to everybody in this building that does interlibrary loan stuff. Uh, so that's the essay that I co-wrote. Um, Rob, you could tell us a little bit about your essay. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, before I do that, uh, I have a question for you. Um, didn't you find out in your research that Cleese was in approximately 150 video arts films? or something? That's more than anything he's ever done. Is at, that right? at least. Um, yeah. I'm still trying to get a complete list. Uh, video arts, um, uh, all, the entire uh, holdings of video arts have been donated to the BBC. So my hope is that folks at the BBC and that some university students uh, in the UK are actively studying this stuff uh, now that they have access to all the materials. Best I can tell, at least 150. It wouldn't surprise me if it's north of 200. Wow, that's, that's incredible. Well, my essay uh, 
is called Superman in the Python Universe, uh, based on around this book called Superman True Brit uh, by Kim Howard Johnson, Python biographer, uh, John Cleese, member of Python, as we know, and uh, artist John Byrne, who is well known for uh, groundbreaking runs on the X-Men and Superman. So what if Superman did not come, end up being sent to Smallville, Kansas, and instead ended up in Western Supermare in the UK, which incidentally is the birthplace of John Cleese. What would happen? Well, Superman True Brit tells us, and let me tell you, it's zany and crazy. And the one thing that Superman was taught by the parents who found him, or his name is Colin Clark, is to not reveal his powers because there's a British um, concept or idea that's very important. What would the neighbors think about what you're doing? So they, they try to get him to not use his powers, and of course that doesn't really work because of course he's Superman, right? Faulty powers on the back here. And studying journalism and ends up working for a tabloid publication called the Daily Smear for a publisher, White Badger. Well, when he finally reveals himself as Superman, all the Daily Smear wants to know and all the public wants to know is who's he dating? What is he doing? You know, who can, um, how can we lift Superman up and then bring him back down? All the while, his parents keep moving to different places without telling Colin, okay? One of the things that Superman is tasked with, kind of like the um, uh, things that, you know, the tribulations they give to Hercules, the tasks, what's that called again? Herculean tasks? Herculean labors, tasks. Labors of Hercules? The, yeah, labors of Hercules. Some of the things he's asked to do include um, decrease the waiting time for hip, op hip operations. Well, and of course, his answer is to have the doctors not play as much golf, which of course doesn't, you know, doesn't endear Superman to the folks who own golf courses. Another thing is improve the programming of the BBC. Okay, well, that's not going to happen, right? Um, and make the trains run on time. So, you know, hilarity ensues and all of that, but. Um, and there are lots of little Python-esque, you know, uh, Easter eggs in here, like the fish slapping dance uh, and so forth. But, and some digs at um, some of the distinguished competition, i.e. Marvel, <laughs> uh, in here, which, you know, of course, Byrne used to work for. Um, but there's a serious message, and oftentimes comedy, no matter how absurd you know, and satire has a serious message behind it. And one of the things that Cleese has had a tremendous amount of personal experience with is with the tabloid press dissing him. You know, his ex-wives, there was a situation on the life of Brian where Cleese purportedly said these racist remarks and it came out in the press, which he had 80 people testify he never said such a thing, okay? So there's, you know, what are the deeper meanings? I mean, how, you know, at the end of the book, Superman is trying to, you know, he reveals himself and he's trying to tell the people that, you know, what, we need to be human here. We don't need to care about who I'm dating. And of course, all they care about is who he's dating. So, you know, there's something beneath the surface that way about the tabloid press and being very, very critical and using humor and satire to criticize the way the tabloids treat people.
Didn't he also get banished to the worst place of all, the United States of America? Well, he, no, he, he goes there um, willingly okay. and tries to start a new life. But unbeknownst to him, White Badger has opened up a, a newspaper office in the U.S., and his parents were moving to the U.S. So <laughs> they haven't done a sequel to this, but it, you know, needless to say, it would be interesting. Um, so uh, that is the, I think that's the conclusion of the prepared remarks we have. Uh, thanks again for coming. Um, as Lynn mentioned, the book is available through Palgrave Macmillan, through their website and retailers like Amazon. Um, the good news is, it's currently only in hardback. The good news is, is next summer it will be published in paperback. So if you want to wait a year, we'll ha be happy to sign a paperback. It's much cheaper than the hardback. Uh, yes. Certainly don't blame you if you want to wait and uh, um, get, a, get a soft cover version of it. Yeah, the hardback's 140 bucks. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty steep, but yeah. it's it's worth it because <laughs> it's an awesome book. So again, that's that's a, the end of our prepared remarks. Uh, thanks very much for coming. But happy to entertain any questions or any clarifications we could offer. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'd like to open up the floor now for any questions that you have. Well, there's Saturday Night Live. Yeah, Saturday Night Live. Canada had, what, Kids in the Hall? Kids in the Hall. Um, I would say Cheech and Chong, mm -hmm. even though it's a different kind of humor, but it's still mm -hmm. absurdist. Yeah. There was also In, in Living Color, right? Yeah, In, the in 90s. Living Color. Um, culture, culture, culture Clash? Cultural Clash? In the, in the 90s? Yeah. I think those were all directly influenced by Monty Python at some degree of other. Well, and, and, you know, one of the biggest shows of all time, South Park. Yeah, I forgot about You know, South Park. Python are, are, are a huge influence on uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who created South Park, so. Did Benny Hill influence You know, that's, that's an interesting question. They don't talk about Benny Hill that much. Mm -hmm. They talk about Spike Milligan and The Goon Show and, uh, uh, you know, Beyond the Fringe uh, influencing them. Um, you know, I think that there's something ingrained in British comedy that is just naturally absurdist, you know? Um, yeah, I, but, I, but in some of the interviews that I've seen, I've never seen them actually refer to Benny, Benny mm -mm. Hill. Have you ever viewed? No. No. Which is surprising because it was extremely popular. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, popular, and popular here, too. Yeah. And Benny Hill is more sophisticated that it tends to get credit for. Not to say it's sophisticated necessarily, but I'd say it's more sophisticated than just the fast motion sort of uh, shenanigans that it, that it sort of turned into in our, in our cultural memory. Um, so, so that show I think is a little bit, yeah, there's a little bit more going on than, than I think sometimes we recall. Uh, but, but yeah, just echo what Rob said. I don't, I've never seen them acknowledge that influence at all. And, it, and that, that certainly could be purposeful. Um. Uh, this is for, for all three of you, if you uh, care to answer. Uh, do you have a, a favorite uh, side project of, of any of the Pythons, of, of all the, any of the six of them? I like them all. But I've recently watched Eric Idle's Rutland Weekend Television, which, you know, um, is pretty awesome. Uh, but I hate to be typical, but Faulty Towers. That one's my favorite too. Yeah. Um. Um, I would I would have said Faulty Towers. I'll say Twin. I'll say Time Bandits just to be different. Mm -hmm. um, Time Bandits was my fir first experience of anything sort of Python esque, and my father took my brother and I to see it. And of course, we had no idea what we were seeing at all. And even once it was done, I had no idea what I just experienced. But I knew it was new. Uh, and had uh, delighted me and confused me, and I, and I wanted more of it. Uh, and of course, that film features a bunch of these guys, and I thought these are, you know, this, yeah, fascinating. So, um, so Faulty Towers is probably my favorite, um, but, but Time Bandits was my first, so I'm comfortable saying Time Bandits, because that's still close to my heart. I, I will say, if I could pick one movie that changed my life and rewired my worldview, and that movie is more relevant 
in 2018 than when it came out in 1985 is Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Brazil. I think one of the things I did enjoy uh, about editing this book was discovering how diverse the group was. I mean, they were artists, they were writers, uh, actors, um, and one of the chapter, uh, like uh, Palin, with his diaries, you know, he's he's pondering gentrification and how his country is changing, and how people are being shifted out of their homes in the area that he grew up. That was one of my favorite chapters. Um, and I think the other one I really enjoyed was the one, um, oh gosh, it's escaping me now, where he's talking about Chaucer's Knight. And, you know, he became, he went to a distinguished college and then he went on to be a member of this famous group. But then when he went back to try to go back to his scholarly roots, he had all this backlash against him because now he was a comedian and he wasn't a serious scholar. And I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, Terry Jones and his work on medieval history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and he is a legitimate historian and yeah. is being acknowledged as such. Yeah. Any more questions? Hi, um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the production of the book. You guys said you started with a call for proposals. Where did you distribute that, and, and how did you encourage quality contributions and the topics you were hoping for, or was it more of just like a crapshoot and you got what you got and then kind of built together around certain themes based on what you got in? Well, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, well, we did send a general one out, but then also Paul and Rob contacted people they knew, and we looked at books that were published by other people in that area that uh, we might contact, and we sent them emails trying to just, you know, we wanted a different a range of abstracts. From there, we would pare down. So, um, but yeah, we did run into the difficulty in that everybody just wanted to write about Monty Python, which is the total opposite of what the book project was. Well, and, and I think with the renewed interest, uh, we were talking mm -hmm. about that earlier when Eric Idle is saying, always look on the bright side of life, which is kind of like an anthem, well, it is an anthem now. Mm -hmm. At, uh, was it the 2012? It was the 2012 Olympics. Okay. And apparently, they, they took a British poll, and it's like the third requested song for funerals in Britain. So you know, if you're going to go out, go out with a smile. And then the, the, the reunion in 2014, where they weren't even sure they were going to sell out, and they ended up, up selling out 10 nights at the O2 Arena and could have probably sold, you know, 100 nights, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine. So. And the Spamalot chapter is really interesting to get a, back, uh, a look at how they work behind the scenes because Idol, you know, reworked the... Uh, what is it? Um, Holy Grail. Holy Grail. And to uh, go on the stage and, you know, he had to meet with the other group to say, okay, you do mine. And at first they kind of gave him the go ahead. But then when it started making so much money, then it became a negotiation process to keep the peace. And so that's a really interesting chapter to see, you know, how they work as a group and separately. And then they all co collapse cooperated towards the end and said okay, but it was fine until it became successful. Any more questions? Um, so my favorite Doctor Who episode is The City of Death, which is written by Douglas Adams and cameos John Cleese. And I was just wondering if you could speak more about the relationship between all those people back then. Well, if memory serves, I think yeah, Douglas Adams actually wrote on the fourth season, some, and uh, you know, they all just kind of know each other. And you know, creative people tend to flock together. You know, we um, we went to that uh, creativity panel this, uh, at lunchtime today, and so it's it's not surprising that they. They knew each other, worked together. Of course, um, another sort of unofficial member of Python uh, was from the group, the Bonzo Dog Duo Band. Did I say that right, Paul? It's close. Close, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Neil Innes. And of course, they were on the show 
Do Not Adjust Your Set, which is one of the uh, pre-Python shows with Eric Idle, Terry Jones, and Michael Palin, and Terry Gilliam did some animation for it. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, overlap there between the, the circles that they run in. Now, Cleese loves to act. And so it's not surprising that he would be on an episode of Doctor Who, which I hate to admit I've not seen. Yeah, I know, it's terrible, isn't it? Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm willing to admit my faults in front of the world, but I will now. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, Douglas Adams, again, Hitchhiker's Guide it has that absurdist, you know, well, it is absurdist. There's no other way to put it. So, you know, they all travel in the sort of the same circles and work together. And, um, you know, even in the various movies, television shows that were not Python, you know, proper, they still worked in each other's movies. They still, you know, wrote together, were on radio shows together. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's akin to being married to people that you can never get a divorce from. And I think that, you know, the Python group and their circle of friends, you know, along with them, Carol Cleveland, I don't want to leave her out because she's, she's really considered the seventh Python. Um, you know, they, they have some kind of connection that you can't break. And um, that's a pretty amazing thing. When, even, even if they can't stand each other, they still, when they get together, there's something unique about that. And, you know, and that, that includes people like Douglas Adams and Neil Innes and so forth. So, and uh, you know, in Cleese's case, his, his ex-wife that he's still friendly with, uh, the only one, I think, that he's friendly with, uh, Connie Booth, who we wrote Faulty Towers with, and she was on a number of Python episodes. Does that answer your question? <laughs> In a long, convoluted way? Anybody else? Okay. We, we have a uh, giveaway tonight. So, Crystal, if you'll draw a name. Kayla West. You win a 25% less sodium can of spam. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Dean Gerlich uh, and TTU Libraries for hosting us. Thanks to the marketing department and their great work, Nora. Uh, Julie, Kaylee, everyone, uh, Ryan, everyone there, um, thank you, Lynn, for emceeing, and thank you all so much for coming. Any other questions or comments? Paul, do you have anything to add? Lynn? I, I did want to follow up. You said that Netflix is carrying the Python. Is it the TV series or is it just the movies? I think it's both. both? That's my okay. understanding. I'm ashamed to admit that I grew up in the Python era and never watched it. <laughs> Well, oh. well, here's a piece of useless trivia for you. And considering we're in the great, did I say great? Did I say great? State of Texas. Python first aired in America in Dallas. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And please help yourself to refreshments before We're you go to Love of Lights.